What's up, Doombots? Tony Skinjili here with the advanced part of the Alliance War advice, guide, whatever word you want to use to describe it. It's just my opinion anyway. So we watched the basic video, which should be linked somewhere here. I don't know how YouTube works anymore. Uh, you got the idea of the basics, you know, be aggressive, make sure your teams are invested, make sure you are uh, playing aggressively and to win fights, not necessarily to defend against fights. And that's the core of it. Now, once you get that basic down, once you're starting to progress through war, you're going to start noticing a couple of things. <clears throat> the first is the relevancy of placement. The truth of the matter is placement isn't incredibly relevant very early on, but there are some things you can do when it comes to placing your rooms and defending them to give you an advantage. So the earliest stages of war, when you just get into war and your alliance is floating around an average TCP of a million, you know, you maybe you got a couple 500,000, maybe you got a guy who's, you know, 1 million, maybe whatever your average TCP is. And there are some numbers that kind of break on average for everybody else, like when everyone has an average of 4 million and 6 million, etc, etc, etc. That's for a later video. For this, it's where your basic alliance is. So the, the way I describe alliance wars are three parts. Uh, there's part one, and that's when you play for points. P. <laughs> when you play for points, you are trying to get as many points as you can because it's very unlikely that your alliance or most of the alliances you'll end up facing off against are going to be able to wipe your entire room. They either don't have the depth of characters, they don't have the, uh, the, the total energy, they're not willing to spend as much because they're not getting as many blitz credits. There's a million reasons why I could work that way. The major reason why it works that way is just because people either go a little bit heavier on defense than they should, or they just don't have the depth of roster to be able to win eight attacks each person on one shot. Because that's all it takes to win a war. If you do the math, there is exactly 12 rooms. There are eight nodes on each side, or a total of 16 nodes. It's 192 wins to win a war, 24 times 8, which is the number of free attacks you get, also 192. So basically, if everyone can go in and win one fight, you will full clear your alliance. That doesn't all happen too often. Usually people are good for three or four attacks in the very early stages of war, and that's the early fight, um, or the earliest stages of war. The second stage of war is when you're close to or reliably full clearing. Um, sometimes it gets a little crazy because of what the meta looks like or you never really know maybe there's one person in that alliance that went really really hard on the black order and put them on defense and you guys just don't have them you really can't control the when or where but you know it's happening when you're noticing either you're getting full cleared or your opponents are full clearing you or you're really close to full clearing them. That's the second stage of war. Um, the key to recognizing that is that you have a very, very solid offense, or more importantly, most of the players have a very well-built-out offense full of eight-plus teams capable of winning a fight based on just what the general rule is, and the defenses are now starting to stack up a little bit more. The people who went hyper-aggressive on offense are now starting to look at their defense teams and putting in some of the meta defenses. Your Red Skull teams, Mercenaries, Marauders, the, the teams that require either very specific responses or the infamous double tap, you know, two people going in to beat them. That's the middle tier of war. That's where most people end up sitting for a long time. Not necessarily a race to full clear, but you feel like you're getting over a thousand twelve hundred points of war and it's possible for you to full clear if you could only have beaten that team with one or two attacks instead of three or four you're not doing as many combat cancels it's still better to be aggressive to make sure that you get into your fight and get a win but the specific teams that need to be beaten become wider and as a result everybody is now racing towards a, a full clear and then there's the third which is after you have reached the point where full clearing is something that everybody within your power and your general pairing works, you end up having to get cute. You end up having to do crazy defense changes. 
you end up taking characters that were previously absolutely amazing on offense and putting them on defense because it's not an issue of whether or not you can win the fight anymore. It's now an issue of how quickly you can win the fight. That's why I tried to avoid using powers and TCPs and average alliance things to set this up because truthfully, those types of wars, that third stage, those tend to happen among some of the highest spenders. Now, not exclusively, but among the highest spenders in the game tend to be buying extra war attacks with the pack of shame offer and making sure they go in. Now, the reason I have this up here is to talk about the first part of it, room placement. It doesn't matter where you are. There's a correct room placement or priority rooms to defend. Now, if you're in that first group that we talked about and you're not really full career and you're playing for points, it stands to reason that if you're paired properly against an alliance that's similar in power to yours, which should happen, whether it does or not is kind of irrelevant, uh, you want to protect the highest point value rooms. Now, of course, bridge and reactor are worth 300 points. Those are the most relevant. You want to see your bridge and reactor somewhere along the bottom, and then realistically, probably split. You want those rooms protected you want the strongest defenses you do have in your roster placed in those, even if that means that someone is a little bit less effective on offense. The bridge and the reactor are the rooms that you want on one or the other side. You can get a little bit cute and maybe move them around in some kind of cute little angle. The reason you want them there is you want them protected. You want those rooms buffed by security or engineering one or the other probably if anything security engineering can buff bridge because it's worth the most points and then the other one would buff reactor so i'd probably put security in the middle reactor here bridge here and engineering exactly where it looks that's just a very simple solution now obviously if everyone did that everyone would know the solution it means you're going down the middle you're seeing the most access. The point is, the idea of going down the middle implies that you're going to win all of the fights you can here, full clear this, and be able to beat both of these nodes. You can get a little clever with it. The idea is just knowing that those two rooms, barracks and reactor, are the highest impact ones. Every other room, you just have to place in some reasonable amount of defense so that people are less inclined to just walk right through it. Doesn't have to be full teams. If anything, you watch the first video, you see how I, I recommended you place defenses as an entire uh, alliance. That'll go with. Now, the second tier, that's where things become different because you're almost or close to full clearing or you are full clearing. Uh, it takes a little bit of effort. Some people might be doing more attacks than others. Reactor and barracks are no longer the highest priority because the fight is no longer about how many points you can get. It's about how quickly you can get uh, key rooms down. At that point, uh, the buff rooms become relevant. Now, the four buff rooms are hangar, armory for offense, and then med bay and barracks for defense. Um, and where you land as which ones are better, that depends on you and your alliance, and I'm not going to go into details on that. For me, I've always thought that Armory and Barracks are among the most important ones because they're pretty flat upgrades uh, across the board, and Med Bay and Hangar are more situational values. A hangar is a great uh, buff to have the deflex, and Med Bay is a lot of HP, but usually when you get to a point where Team A beats Team B, it doesn't really matter how much more health they have, you know? It's all an issue of whether or not they have the answers to your questions. So that's when you start protecting like barracks and armory first and med bay and hangar. Bridge and reactor stop being worth as much because it's about time. The first person to take the barracks wipes out 30% of the value. If you take your opponent's barracks while you still have armory, it's technically like a 60 point swing. You're 30% higher than their team that's now 30% lower. So it's pretty meaningful. Same thing in reverse. If armory is, if you take their armory first and you still have barracks, your team is going to be significantly more defensive. Uh, Med Bay and Hangar doesn't work exactly like that, but they're still relatively important. So now when you move to that stage, the people who were previously 
uh, like the best defenders, the guys who were in Bridge and Reactor, well, they now move to Barracks and Armory, based on whatever you decide. Then you get to add additional teams to there. You could choose Medbay or Hangar. Either one is, is relevant. That's when the engineering and security debuffs, you know, the defense down or defense up buffs, that's when those come into play to start protecting barracks and armory. Now, you can apply the exact same logic, barracks and armory at the bottom two points, right here and right here, and then you could put, you know, security here and leave engineering here. That's great. The issue is because now your opponents are very capable of clearing most, if not all, of your defense teams, you are very weak to a attack down the middle. Because it's no longer an issue of whether they have the resources, now it's an issue of whether they can find the right teams or the right rooms and take advantage of it. So while some people might say, well, if you put them here, it takes them the longest time to get there, correct, and if everyone did that, it wouldn't matter because it only came down to whether or not they could win the fight. So this is where you can get a little bit clever. You can do something I like to call the Dorito, which is place a buff room, like uh, engineering and security here, double buff one room, and then have two rooms here each separately buffed. Those are up to you. Get really clever with it. But the whole point is the value of rooms like bridge, reactor, they went down dramatically. The value of the rooms that you need to keep to make sure that you're still flowing or need to take out to make sure that you still have value against your opponent, they go differently. So it becomes a little bit different. At that point, I think the average player needs to understand going down the middle is no longer the best option. You probably want to pick a side and just dig until you find, which is half clearing a room, half clearing a room, find a room worthwhile. For example, if you do that and find engineering right here, a smart bet would be that one of these two rooms is a room that's worth buffing by engineering. So you half clear it or full clear it and you end up with access to two reasonably powerful rooms. That's generally for placement. At the highest end, when the one we were talking about earlier where it's about getting clever and cute, that's where armory, barracks, they are completely nullified. Their value is almost non-existent. Now you still wanna take them. If you see them, they, they hurt your opponent by taking them or they help you by taking them. Those are great. But it's the weird rooms that become higher impact. It's the cargo bay, the hangar, and the med bay buff that become relevant. Because once powers get so great, 40% of health, which is the med bay buff itself, can be insane. Remember, 40% of a small number is a small number. 40% of a very high number is equally as high. Characters that previously didn't make too much of a difference with 40% health, like rhinos because they were all 30k and you know their increased health pool made them irrelevant now become relevant because they're healing for so much more on the sinister six team or the marauders team just has so much more shield because of how med they work so while as you go up it's not an issue of rooms becoming less important it's an issue of prioritizing becoming different so in these rooms hangar is a huge boost against your opponent's offense. Them coming in with blocks means that a lot of your defenses aren't gonna be doing something. So if you see an early hangar room, taking it as early as possible is going to make sure that every fight you do from that point on is significantly easier. And since the entire thing is not about who, whether or not they can full clear, but whether or not you can full clear before them, you probably wanna focus a little bit more on that. Same thing with Cargo Bay. You would think Cargo Bay is not really a high impact room, but the debuff that you get from fighting in Cargo Bay can be enough to separate the teams that could normally just absolutely beat them to the teams that might have to be uh, beaten multiple times or used with multiple attacks with multiple people, etc. Once you get to that high end tier, combat cancels and double taps become your lifeblood because every wasted attack uh, your opponent does is an opportunity for you to succeed. And you can actually track that if you look at your war right before the end of it and track the participation, you could see how many defensive wins you got versus how many attacks they had. 
and then you can compare well we got this many defensive wins they got this many and that's ended up being how it was relevant now again defensive wins are great but only if you have the offense that could normally beat them if you have a strong enough offense if you have the right pool of characters to beat your opponent's teams it doesn't matter how many defensive wins they could have gotten from good teams because you were able to beat them. So it's always, always correct to be more aggressive, but this is where things get a little bit cuter. So that's the biggest part of the advancement of knowing where to place your rooms. And this is just generic picture of generic rooms. Um, in general, if I were to look at this room, I would say overall, this placement doesn't benefit anyone. Uh, at any stage if you are an early alliance player alliance war player like bridge being here and reactor being here is a huge give you're giving up a lot um if you're in a mid tier yes you have barracks and armory but none of them are harder to beat than the opponent so going right down flight deck one is a death sentence for you because they'll be able to take your barracks and your armory relatively quickly conversely going down flight deck three well, reactor doesn't mean anything to them that much. Engineering could be half cleared, and then med bay, armory, barracks, still boost. This is called taking the L, because if you do it, you're going to take the L. You're going to lose. Uh, and even maybe at endgame, this is kind of unique, um, in that you're, you're kind of trying to stall. Security buffing these rooms actually becomes a little bit more relevant because of the random buffs from cargo bay and the disrupt on reactor so this as an end game like super hardcore we are playing racing to full clear kind of alliance this defense actually holds a little bit more water than some of the others but even then you're not getting too much of value out of out of engineering double buffing reactor uh hangar is as we said a little bit higher impact bridge is less relevant so maybe moving a couple of the the rotating this triangle over here around in one direction or another might be meaningful keeping hangar here because if someone goes down flight deck two not high impact armory is one of the most important rooms no matter what but you don't want to give it away but at the same point you don't need to be as serious as protecting it uh at this point you were just kind of leaning on to which of your players have the most power and you're placing them accordingly so that's it as far as defense placement room placement prioritizing and even somewhat an attack strategy question as to whether or not you should go down the middle or the side those are pretty much great choice there is one last thing about attack strategy i can tell you it is almost never correct to pivot at any stage pivoting is of course if you are going towards a, a direction and you find that it's impossible for you to beat a specific team to go in a completely different direction. For example, if you go down flight deck one, you reach hangar in this picture, uh, and there's a team you, no one in your alliance can beat, you wouldn't necessarily then go, oh, well, it's time to go down flight deck three. What's probably best at that point is to move back up one, full clear this room, and then move on here. You're getting at least the extra 90 points, the 40 for the half, and then the 50 for the full, without wasting your time attacking a flight deck, which, fundamentally is not increasing your score but giving you access to a room that might be able to push you down a different path it's almost never correct to go to a full pivot almost sometimes it'll work but planning to do that is planning to fail you want to make sure that you have the ability to beat the teams and also remember that not every war is winnable especially if you get paired up like 50 or 60 million total power sometimes you're just not going to end up winning at that level and it's okay save your resources and move on uh, the last point to make is called alliance balancing now in the very early stages of war we're assuming one thing we are assuming that your alliance has roughly the same power you know maybe the top guy is like a million and the bottom guy is like 500,000 and everyone somewhere falls in between there. Well, that's a fairly balanced roster or alliance roster. And the top alliances, uh, we'll use mine for example, uh, we have a 12,000, 11,000, 11, 10, 10, and then we scroll down at the bottom is a six, and that's a huge, huge gap. Um, sometimes you see them tighter, sometimes you see them looser. 
Keep in mind, your alliance power is more or less what chooses the pairing of your roster. Now, the pairing system itself is broken. We know that for a fact. The We've seen people face off against alliances that are way stronger than them or way weaker than them, and that's just a failure of the system that cannot be quantified, really. So when you balance your roster, what ends up benefiting you the most as an alliance, now don't go change everything, is making sure that whatever the highest person and the lowest person on your roster averages out to be is steady. What does that mean? Well, that means if your top person's a million and your bottom person is 500,000, that means you want the average power to be somewhere around 750,000. If your top person is 10 million and your bottom person is 1 million, then you want the average person to be about 6 million. And this number keeps going. So if your top is 10 and your bottom is 1, that's 11 divided by 2, 5.5 to 6. If the next stage, I'm sorry for the math here, guys, is 9 million and then the next slowest person is 2 million, the numbers keep the same. That's a little trick you can do because what you end up doing is you building your roster around a power that half of your roster is equal or greater than. If you build your roster out to be averaged around 7 million points or 4 million points, in theory, you will be faced off against opponents who are also averaged around 4 million points. So the top people, the strongest people in your roster are going to be able to crush anything that a 4 million power roster has. And the bottom people, well, they're not gonna do too much against a 4 million power, but at the same time, they might be able to do cleanup work. Uh, and as a result of it, they will be carried uh, in a way that benefits you, the carrier, and them, the carried, carry, carrier. Anyway, that is a, a method you can take when building out your alliance to make sure that when you're facing off against opponents, you have the best opportunity to take advantage of more tightly organized and more tightly kept alliances. Because, as I said, if everybody in the alliance you're facing is about 4 million power, and the average power in your alliance, when you add it all up and divide it by 24, is about 4 million, the guys at the top are gonna walk over the average person in your opponent's alliance, and the guys at the bottom probably aren't going to do too much, but at the same point, it doesn't really make too much of a difference. You're giving them a couple of attacks into one room at the cost of them being completely obliterated by the top members of your alliance. That's pretty much it for the advanced. Uh, thank you guys so much for watching. If you have any comments or questions, let me know below in the comments section. And uh, there is one more video coming out, and this is what I like to call the expert level alliance war. Everything in that video is completely circumstantial, uh, anecdotal evidence at best, and it's just fun stuff to do in alliance war, like when to change your teams to be like crazy and how to prioritize who goes where. We'll talk about that another time. Anyway, have a good night. Have a great day. I've been Tony Scangeli, and I'll catch you later.